Hey, my name is Bill Ferreter, and it's time for another 10 minute team tip. So, working with a group of teachers this week around student self assessment, and they asked me, Hey, Bill, would looking at exemplars be a way to get students to start to assess their own progress towards mastery? And the answer to that question is yes, absolutely. What a great strategy. You see, when you ask students to look at exemplars, products that resemble what your expectations are, and then you have them examine those exemplars for success criteria, can you find the individual elements within this exemplar that may make it so that it meets our expectations for mastery? Students are doing some deep reflection about what mastery looks like to begin with. And that deep reflection can then translate to an examination of their own work. What makes exemplars so powerful, particularly when you're working with older students, is they're judging, right? They're looking at a work sample and judging it, but they're not judging themselves. So that deeply personal evaluative judgment of, oh, I didn't meet the mark, that's sometimes tough for a kid to wrestle with. But when you're asking them to look at exemplars, it's not, oh, I didn't meet the mark. It's this particular exemplar didn't meet the mark. That's a whole different story for students. They're oftentimes more willing to critically examine a work sample that's not theirs. And that's because that work sample isn't theirs, right? There's less personal psychological risk to identifying weaknesses in a paper that doesn't belong to you. Y'all with me so far? Jan Shapwee is one of my very favorite assessment experts. And what Jan says is that when you ask students to look at exemplars, both exemplars of strong performance and weak performance, what they can do is start to develop a better understanding of what your definition of accuracy and quality really is. Sometimes students produce, produce work samples that we look at and go, man, that isn't even close to what I expected. The problem wasn't that the student didn't try to meet your expectations. The problem was that students didn't know what your expectations were to begin with. So sharing exemplars helps students to have a better picture of what it is that you expect before they go and create a work product to begin with. In, uh, in, in the feedback world, we like to call that feed forward. Let's give students information before they make a mistake. Because if you can give them enough information before they make a mistake, you might prevent errors from, be, from the beginning. It makes sense, right? So the way that I like to do exemplars in my classroom is using what's called a high-low comparison task. And I'm going to leave a link for you in the chat box to a digital version of a high-low comparison task. If you want to open it up now and exp explore it before I move forward in the video, go ahead. Otherwise, know that you can go back and check it out later, like after you're done watching the entire video. I've got screen grabs for you. But feel free to pause the video, open up the doc, give it a look, think it through, and then come back and hear me explain it. That's a you choice. So when you look at a high-low comparison task in my class, the very top of the document is going to look like this every single time. I always start by listing for the students what the success criteria for the assignment is. I want to be crystal clear with kids up front. If you want to meet my expectations, here's the things I expect to see in the work product that you're creating. In this case, this is a sixth grade exemplar of students who are writing conclusions for a lab report. Remember, I was a science teacher. So what I'm saying to my students in advance is, in a good conclusion, I should see a summary of your findings. I should see you reflect on any of the results that you collected that were surprising to you. I want you to share any lessons that other people can learn from your findings. What do you think your data means to everyone else? And last but not least, I want you to give me an example of a follow-up experiment that you would like to try. Those are my success criteria. That's what I'm looking for in your work. And then what I've done is I've given my students two different conclusions. Those are exemplars. By the way, those exemplars were not taken from students, like it's not student work. They're exemplars that were created by my collaborative team together. Why? Well, two reasons. First, we never wanted a student to catch their conclusion being the low conclusion in a high-low comparison task. It's not fair to kids. 
But second, we found that as teachers, the conversation that went into creating the exemplar was a really good learning opportunity for us. We were able to say, well, what would we want to see in a student work sample? And what kind of mistakes do we know we're going to see? That's a learning opportunity for teachers. So building the high-low comparison task is a more meaningful learning opportunity for you as professionals if you create the exemplars together. Smart, right? So we give the kids those two exemplars and we point blank tell them conclusion number one is better than conclusion number two. Now you figure out why. The next step in the process is that students work either individually or in groups. You can structure that however you want. I almost always did it in groups because I wanted that conversation to happen between students. Remember, they're thinking evaluatively here, right? They're looking at the work product. They're looking at the success criteria. They're trying to spot where they see the success criteria. It's pretty high-level thinking. So what do you got to do sometimes? Have a partner to do that high-level thinking with. So I would have chosen to have them work together most of the time. And their first job was to go and highlight the individual success criteria in both conclusions. So where do you see a summary of findings? Highlight that in purple. Where do you see the author reflecting on surprising results? Highlight that in yellow. Where do you see the author sharing lessons that people can learn? Highlight that in orange. So students did that together. What I was trying to get them to do is look at these work samples and spot the success criteria in action. That provides clarity around what high performance looks like and means in action. I'm giving the students my expectations up front and an example of the expectations. But as they highlight the high task and the low task, what they inevitably find out is that there's a success criteria that's missing from the second conclusion. Can you spot it? It was easy to spot, wasn't it? There's no green highlight over there on the right-hand side. That's intentional. When I have the kids highlight the two uh, exemplars, if they're using color, they can quickly spot the success criteria that's missing. The second author didn't include a follow-up experiment that they want to try. By the way, remember, we created the exemplars, right? Our teacher team did that together. We left that part out because it's the part that students left out the most often in our work. We knew they were going to make that mistake. We were trying to draw their attention to that error in these two exemplars. Once students have finished doing their highlighting with a partner, they sit down and they make check marks in a feedback grid at the very bottom of the doc. What they're doing there is they're saying, in the first conclusion, could I see a summary of findings? In the first conclusion, could I see a reflection on surprising results? When that conversation was over with, if students had disagreement with their partner, if I thought a criteria existed and you didn't, that became a really great conversation between kids. Well, work it out. Like, if you think there's a follow-up experiment, show me where it is. All of this work happened before students turned in their final copy, but after they had finished their first draft. So the last step was, okay, guys, now you've looked at a high conclusion. You've looked at a low conclusion. You've spotted success criteria in each of those exemplars. Now go look at your own work. Go look at your first draft. Do that same work with your first draft and see whether or not you can spot our success criteria in your work. Because if you can't, you got to revise before you turn that mug in. You see how this works? Exemplars give kids clarity around what our expectations for both accuracy and content should look like in action. Have students examine those exemplars so they get a sense for what you're expecting and then have them go look at their own work. What's interesting in using the exemplar is remember that this is a a low stakes psychological task for kids because they're not actually looking at their own work to begin with. They're spotting errors, but it's not in their own work. They're much more likely to spot errors in work that isn't theirs because it's psychologically safe to do it. 
Even when we have students look at peer work, they're not likely to call out errors in a peer's assignment because that's not psychologically safe either. But calling out errors that you spot in an exemplar that, that you have no idea who it belongs to, that's easier to do. It makes sense, doesn't it? Now, I do want to point one thing out before moving on. When we talk about a high-low comparison task, what you're looking at here isn't like an A and a D. In fact, what we typically did on our high-low comparisons tasks is the high example was an A. It exceeded our expectations in some way. And the low example was actually grade level expectation. That was like what we thought we were going to see in student work. Sometimes we would do the high was a B and the low was a C. You don't want there to be a drastic difference in the quality of the two exemplars you share because then you take away the challenge of the task. It's not really evaluative thinking if it's easy to spot all of the errors that were made in the low task. So we didn't choose really high and really low as our comparison. We chose two exemplars that had small differences between them because it required a higher level of evaluation on the part of the kid. Now, that, all that, that you've seen, that whole activity, worthwhile just by itself. But it led to something awesome. I didn't see this coming. I didn't ask my students to do this. I don't really know like how they thought to do it but they started turning their work in highlighted by success criteria. So their final product included the same highlights that they had done on the exemplars they looked at before. It was almost like they were saying, hey, Mr. Ferreter, look, we included everything you told us to include, so you better give us a good grade, it's there. I loved that as a teacher, not because it made grading easier, but because it meant that the kids while they were producing their final copy, were thinking about, did they include the success criteria that I was asking for? Isn't that what you want kids to do when they're creating work? Don't you want them to consider the success criteria while they're creating their final product? That was a pleasant side effect of this whole activity as they started to highlight success criteria in their final products before they turned it into me. One last thing that I want to share that's really important for you to understand, and, and I will link... Uh, yeah, I'll create this as a separate set of slides for you and link it down in the session description so that you can explore a little bit more. Primary teachers oftentimes say, well, how do I do this, right? Like, you know, my kids can't read all that text. There's no way that they can do that. I never told you the exemplar had to be text. What if you tried giving your students a whiteboard and having them record their performance? The sample that I have here on my screen for you to explore, this happens to be a student solving a math problem. It's a third grade student solving a math problem. Same activity, right? Look up at the top, criteria, success criteria are listed. If you're gonna do this successfully, you gotta set up your lattice, you gotta multiply and add all your numbers accurately, and you gotta write neatly so that nothing gets goofed up. But the exemplars, the high-low solutions, they're videos. So a student can watch a video of a performance and then evaluate it too. That would be fantastic in a performance-based class. If you're the art teacher, how is that not an art picture on the right and on the left? If you're a PE teacher, how is this not a student that's performing a, a skill that you've taught them during your PE class? If you're a dance teacher, how is this not two dance performances? If you're a band director, how is this not two kids playing an instrument? So the exemplars can be videos too. Does that make sense to you? So I don't want you to think that this is just something that has to be done with text. An exemplar can be any work product that you're asking students to create in your classroom. If kids dance in your room, the exemplar should be dances that they explore. If kids are solving math problems on whiteboards in your room, that's the work product that should be inside that exemplar box. Make the exemplar the same kind of work you'd ask kids to do. The point, the process is the same though. Tell them what the success criteria is and let them examine exemplars to see if they can spot those success criteria in action. All right, hope this made sense. If you have any questions for me, you know, you can find my email address down in the session description. Feel free to shoot them along. Hope you enjoyed the video. Talk more soon.